Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, founder and CEO of the Family Online Safety Institute, Stephen Balcom. Come on team, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for being uh, prompt in returning. Um, so now we have, uh, gonna switch gears a little bit um, and we're gonna talk about how parents navigate their kids' digital lives. We certainly saw some interesting stats and some qualitative reports uh, earlier. Um, our moderator for this session is another good friend of ours, uh, Catherine Tiedelbaum. She is the head of Family Trust for Amazon Kids, working to ensure that Amazon products and services continue to earn the trust of families around the world. She has held numerous trust and safety positions over many years going back to her days at Yahoo in the 90s when we first met, and importantly, she is a former educator. Please join me in welcoming Catherine and the rest of our panel. Thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, I'm Catherine. I'm head of Family Trust for Amazon Kids. And I'm getting my good morning call from my son in California. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen now. Um, so our team works on devices and services for kids. We have a content subscription that includes games and apps and videos, um, ad-free books, etc., cetera, um, and a parent dashboard. So I'm really excited because... I get to talk to this group of experts um, about parenting on a topic that I never grow tired of, and that is thinking about the role of technology with our, within our families, within our um, school communities, and um, we really are experts up here. I have a 16-year-old boy, um, but between us, we have 12 kids, <laughs> and the youngest are five, and the oldest are 22. So, we have been there, we have done that when it comes to technology. I thought it would be fun to jump in with um, a question instead, kind of along with our introductions. So panelists, uh, I think starting with Carrie, I thought it would be interesting if you could tell us a little bit about the most recent or most memorable conversation you've had within your family about devices and screen time. Sure. So by way of introductions, uh, my name is Carrie Gallagher. I have the privilege of serving as the assistant principal for teaching and learning at a school called St. John's Prep in Danvers, Massachusetts. We're, we have 1,500 boys on campus, grades 6 through 12. Um, I also am the education director for an internet safety nonprofit called Connect Safely. Um, we produce lots of guides for parents and educators on empowered use of technology. And I have, um, which is the great irony of my life. Um, I work entirely with boys professionally, but I have two daughters, um, and they are ages 14 and 11 at home. My most recent conversation about tech was last night in my hotel room, FaceTiming with my 11-year-old who was asking for more screen time <laughs> because um, I think she forgot that while I was away, I still am able to kind of monitor her use and her choices, <laughs> and I also am um, able to watch the clock and let her know that her time limit was up because it was bedtime, so we were able to say goodnight directly there. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. um, Jarius and Terrell? Yes, so I am Jarius Joseph. I am one half of Terrell and Jarius. <laughs> we are full-time influencers. We are parents to two little five-year-olds who are currently at home sick. Um, uh, so that's been a time. This is their first year in school, and it has been rough. <laughs> um, but our most re well, my most recent conversation about um, online safety and, and screen time is um, my daughter actually recently came up to me and found out from her grandmother that she was on TikTok and was going viral. Uh, <laughs> so she wanted to be able to see the video, so I showed her. And um, as we were continuing to watch the video, she wanted to keep scrolling. And I'm like, no, now's not the time to be on TikTok having a moment. 
Um, so we continued the conversation and she was like, well, dad, why can't I be on TikTok? I, I love all of our videos that we do, but um, I want to see more. And I'm like, no, um, I think the most important part for us is to be able to spend time together, to be able to get outside. How about we go and like take some swimming lessons, go jump on the trampoline, <laughs> roll around in the grass or something like that. Like, let's go outside and spend time as a family. <laughs> yeah, just to piggyback off of that, I think that um, for us having the youngest kids and having five-year-olds, um, it's been a challenge with screen time. I think that when we were um, becoming parents and you know you have all of these goals of when I become a parent I'm gonna do this I'm gonna handle this this way um, I'm not gonna have my kids in front of the TV or iPads I think that all of that changed around year three four um, <laughs> when we got extremely busy and we started taking flights and um, they weren't interested in the movies on the plane so we had to um, bring all of their favorite TV shows um, on their iPads and so um, for us it's been about um, Similar is just about monitoring screen time and making sure it doesn't consume their entire day. Um, but luckily, I think we have a little bit more time, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, before they <laughs> want to be super active on social media. Well, clearly, Aria wants to be on TikTok. All <laughs> yeah, <laughs> clearly. Avi? So my name is Avi Greengart. I'm a tech analyst um, with my own firm, Techsponential. And the, um, I test devices for a living or I access them and, and talk to the vendors and uh, service providers and retailers about them. And there's a constant stream of new devices that are coming in. So most of my kids are terribly jaded. Um, <laughs> but the nine-year-old is still willing and open to seeing what's new. Um, and I told them that um, we were going to get in a new device. This was just the other week. Um, uh, we're getting in a new device, a kid's tablet, and would he be willing to test it with me? And his response was, does it count against my screen time? <laughs> like, no, testing a device with, for, for, for my work doesn't count against your screen time. <laughs> then sure! <laughs> Good one. I love that. Alicia. Hi, um, it's great to be here. And uh, I am the Senior Director for Global Youth Policy at Twitch, which is a live streaming platform owned by Amazon. And um, I actually, funny story, this weekend, my kids, who are big Roblox fans, hi to my Roblox friend. Roblox team. Um, uh, have started playing a game called YouTube Life on Roblox, where you like pretend to be a YouTuber. Um, and so it's actually like this great conversation starter because there's all these different like elements. You get more points if your content is trending. Well, why might it be trending? Like what does trending mean? You also have to like make sure that you eat and get enough sleep and like fill up your you know rest and health you know so that you can like take a break from making your content. So it's actually very clever, and it was like a really good. Um, and I should also say I have nine-year-old twins, uh, a boy and a girl who are actually this is like one good game that they both really love to play together. So it's also super fun just to hear them like chatting from the other room about like okay what are we gonna do next? You know what's our plan? So that's quite fun. There's something very meta about YouTube Live on Roblox. <laughs> yeah. um, so I want to make sure we just kind of all start with a, a level, a level uh, definition here. And maybe Alicia, you'll kick this off. Can you tell us, like, how do you define screen time? Well, so I um, have the privilege of having done a lot of research with parents before I started working in tech. So I spent a couple years working with Sonia Livingston, who's here today as well, talking with parents about how they define and think about screen time. So the one thing I would say is that no two parents define it the same, um, and that screen time can mean both the minutes on the clock, but it can also mean the kind of content and interactions and engagement that happens within that window. So one of the great privileges of you know, spending time interviewing 70 plus families is that you really realize that there's like no two, there's no two ways that, you know, everyone defines this. For my family, um, you know, I think mostly the kind of stuff that I put in the quote unquote screen time bucket that I actually pay attention to is probably gaming and kind of watching content. But if they're doing any kind of making or um, communicating with friends or communicating with family, we don't really put like time limits on that, um, and mostly we, you know, actually try to be pretty flexible about following their lead as well with their interests. 
I kind of concur with that. So um, we're in a very different age where, you know, screen time is just everywhere. Um, and it's no way to really get around it. It's no way to kind of avoid it. And I think we've always, we've historically been taught to look at it in, in kind of a negative way, kind of like Terrell was explaining earlier, where, um, you know, you go into parenting as new parents with this, this negative connotation associated with screen time. So uh, for us, it hit a little bit different when we became influencers and all of our work is online. So for us, we try to approach screen time a little bit different, um, whereas I try to look at it in a positive way. So what are you getting from it? Um, it could be spending time with their grandparents who lives 10 plus hours away. So if they're using screen time to connect with family, then for us, that's a positive thing. And I don't want to take away from that. Um, there are moments where, you know, it can be teaching as well, where you can go in and you can help them to, you know, create beautiful things. Um, there's a lot of programs out there that help with art and that help with reading and things like that. So that I don't really consider to be screen time. I kind of think of it, it I kind of put it in the bucket of educational. Um, now, there are going to be times where the kids do see other kids playing and Jesus, I don't know why kids love like watching other kids like open presents, but like our <laughs> kids go insane with it. Um, so those are the things that I'll put into screen time because it's not something that's really enriching them, but it is something that brings them joy. And I don't want to take away from that as well. Just want to make sure we're, we're monitoring it in a, in a way that's conducive to it being safe for them. I think one of the great parts of, about what we do um, online is that a lot of companies actually reach out because we have kids and um, I'll say lab rats for lack of a better term but they're just like oh why don't you try this out and um, you know how, how are your kids using screen time so the the beauty is that we get to test a lot of it out and see what works and we've actually found some really good um, ways through our work um, to make sure that they're definitely not on their phones as much as their dads are. <laughs> I really think the focus on screen, screen time as a conversation is a mistake. Like I think that we need to look at our children's lives from an overarching perspective of wellness. Like are they forming relationships, whether those relationships are partly online and partly in person? Are they getting enough exercise? Are they getting healthy food? Are they getting enough sleep? Do they feel like they're a part of communities that they care about? And I'm finding that my children are able to do that through things like Roblox, but also on their lacrosse team and their ski racing team. And when I ask them what they want to do for their birthday parties, because we can do that again, birthday parties, we can get kids together. Yeah. Um, my 14-year-old wants to do a bowling birthday party with her friends. And my 11-year-old just did one with like traditional fall activities like apple bobbing and like the don't, eating the donuts off the strings. Mm -hmm. And like that's how they want to spend time with their friends. So. If they want to spend time with their friends doing things like that, playing sports and doing those outdoor activities, and then they also want to be on FaceTime, then I'm feeling like we have an overarching good perspective on wellness as a family. And if I get caught up in worrying about screen time, I just don't think that that's healthy for them or for me. So we, we define screen time actually with an actual definition. So um, if screen time is passive content consumption. And active participation in any form, be just because it's a screen, um, is not, does not count against screen time. So you're on Minecraft and you're building a level, doesn't count. You're on Minecraft watching somebody else build the level, that counts. <laughs> that counts. <laughs> um, and it also varies by age um, and by child. I, I have the most kids on, on the panel here. I have five. <laughs> um, and the greatest uh, age range, too. So. Um, one of the things that we found was that screen time for the older kids, while we were relatively strict about it, at least for some of the kids, pre-pandemic, once the pandemic hit, it was just out the window because they're, you know, they were on screens all day long and it was, then it became really hard to parse between are you chatting with friends, that shouldn't count against screen time, or are you watching something in between chatting with friends, so. Or at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes right? with the friends, which is great. <laughs> that wouldn't count against, so we had a very strict definition, and for the nine-year-old, we still sort of do, but for, for the older ones, much less so. That said, we still do monitor, just like you were saying, with your, your like, my, even my 15-year-old still has parental controls on his phone 
uh, that monitor how much screen time he's used and basically shut it off. And of course, he's always asking me to extend it. The, the key, though, is he can also pick up his tablet. He can also pick up his laptop. He could also use the Xbox. So it, it's really more a, a mindfulness around screen time that he shouldn't get sucked into it. And he knows that, and that's why he hasn't asked, told me, oh, I'm too mature for screen time. You should take this off. He recognizes, you know, not all kids do, but this one, this one does, that you know, <laughs> there, are, there should be screen time limits. I think it's interesting because you, all of you referred to kind of norms in your household. And one of the things that I've been told and cautioned both as um, I'm a former educator, elementary school, and um, as a parent is you look at the child, take a step back, look at the child holistically. And if you see things like friendships changing, um, sleep changing or not happening, food, things like that, like that's more important than the absolutes in any of these columns. And one of the things, like I'm working at Amazon, uh, Amazon Kids, I'm working on a parent dashboard, and one of the things I discovered when I joined the team is they had a learn first concept. I was like, huh, I could have used that. Um, and it just meant that you know, you could, you're gonna read before you do something else. That would have worked pretty well in my household. I'm wondering, um, you know, I, I believe that safety is personal. I think everything with per parenting is personal. I'm wondering if you all would be willing to talk a little bit about like kind of what kind of guardrails, um, or if you have another term for guardrails, I think of them as kind of my guardrails where we can kind of <laughs> let my kid navigate. But I know not everybody thinks of it that way, um, that you've implemented with your kids and in your families. Yeah, I could start. We, yeah. um, you know, as I mentioned, um, we actually have used Amazon Kids Plus, and so um, familiar with Parent Dashboard, um, oh, yeah. Apple, similar, um, mm -hmm. you know, with screen time, being able to, to monitor it as much as possible. Yep. I often feel that I'm adding more time more than I'm saying, you know, cut it off <laughs> um, uh, because I'm, they're still five, so they know how to get to me. Um, but I think that the, the biggest they part is... They just get better at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest part is just moderation. And again, I think, you know, as Jaria said earlier, as long as I feel like they're learning something, um, we're still just trying to figure out how to, um, again, navigate those guardrails with their age and, and actually what they're consuming. And so... Um, I think that we've all kind of pretty much collectively said that if it's something educational, that's what we're looking more towards rather than just like saying, okay, you hit your 30 minutes, like we're going to cut it off. Um, so our guardrails are, um, I don't know how to say it, very loose <laughs> um, because I don't know how much, yeah, <laughs> how much our five-year-olds are taking away from, you know, being on YouTube kids, but you know, again, just to kind of say kudos to you guys, one app, you know, Amazon Kids Plus, I think that um, it's filled with books and, and you know, educational games. And so with there, they get much more screen time than they would if they were just on their iPads. <laughs> That's kind of an ir irony yeah. there. I think I should have also asked you guys, as the second part to that question is, you know, have your, have your guard rules or your norms in your family changed over time? Um, I, could, I love to speak, I, I really like to refer to it as training wheels instead of guardrails because it allows us to do what others have said, which is following their lead. So it's not like a predetermined path that I set. They get to decide their path. I'm just there to support them with the training wheels. And I think a part of that is there's this expectation built into my parenting that they're going to make mistakes and that's, that's a part of it. So, a great example of this, my now 14-year-old, the first social media platform I allowed her to start with was TikTok without putting any time limits on it because I expected that she would be locked in and like overuse it at first. And I wanted to let her do that so that we could then have the conversation about now that I look right at our screen time measurements, this is how much time you spent on TikTok this week. Is that how you want to spend your time? Like, is that how you want to live your life? Spending this much time on this one thing? Like, what did you get from that? And I think that reflective conversation is really important. And um, one, of the, I, one of the philosophies, I think, with guardrails is that if, if too restrictive, which I know is not what you're talking about in your question, yeah. but if too restrictive and it just cuts off all the time, it doesn't give them the opportunity to learn from those mm -hmm errors, and that's why I think that training wheels metaphor works better for, for that philosophy. Which I love, by the way, and I think that um, 
when we were having our conversation, I actually love the term guardrails too. Um, but you made me think of it in a different way because I do think that parenting is different for everyone and everyone's going to define it themselves and, and everyone's going to go through their own personal journey. Um, but I think for me, I have a, a real struggle sometimes with knowing that they are going to go out and they are going to make mistakes and that they are going to have to go down their own path. But, you know, sometimes I've seen the path. You know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you know, you, you kind of see your kids going down a certain way. And I like the idea of guardrails because I kind of think of it like bowling. When you have guardrails up, the bowling ball just goes wherever and hits the walls, but it still stays on like the right path. And it gets, you know, somewhere where you're going to land in a healthy spot. But then I like the training wheels idea too because it's like you're, you're giving kids the freedom to be able to, to go and explore in a way that's natural to them. So that they understand it. So that they can be if you just to cut it off, they'll never understand it. And I wanted to make sure that I, I mentioned to you that I love that. Oh, that thank you. you made me think yeah, of it differently. Yeah. I think maybe, I mean, maybe you start with guardrails and they have to earn their way to training wheels. Like they build some <laughs> trust for, I don't know. I think. Well, I think it's to, to every child is different. So yeah. I feel like, you know, we've seen nieces and nephews as well. So, you know, some experience, the just cutting and get off then it's the questions of, well, why do I only have 30 minutes? Whereas if you let them spend six hours, then you can say, well, here's why you only have 30 minutes, because you spent the whole day on it, so they have a better understanding. So I think it, for everyone, it's different, but I do love that. As sure. Well. We, um, so, so my nine-year-olds, I feel like I should give a shout-out to, uh, to Amazon for Kids Plus. Um, my nine-year-old does use that, and, it, it, there, and we feel very confident that he's just going to be watching National Geographic stuff over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, my 17-year-old, though, when she was younger, uh, one of the key guardrails was she wanted to be a YouTube star. Um, and we initially would not let her have her own account. Uh, we would not let her post anything publicly. Um, once she, when she turned 15, she gave us a PowerPoint presentation on why she should have an account. That a girl. Um, yeah. And we were like, <laughs> just the PowerPoint presentation alone, you got it. Um, Some healthy yeah. screen time. Uh, <laughs> and, um, no, that, and, and, right, so, um, but even then, we didn't want her to have identifying information, and we wanted the comments turned off, because one of the critical concerns there was, you, know, you just see all the body negativity uh, around the around comments and uh, and that's the that was my key concern um, for that particular child. But in general, our, our biggest guardrail, honestly, is that we are Orthodox Jews and we observe the Sabbath. So um, we are a very very tech heavy f family, um, and everything gets turned off for 25 hours. Um, and I know there was I believe someone else spoke at this conference in the past. Yeah. Um, about the digital Sabbath, and I think it's a great idea, um, but the fact that we're doing this as a communal activity means that, and I checked with her beforehand to, I'm allowed to say this, if she didn't, if she wanted to text her friends on the Sabbath, none of her friends are doing it either. Right. So they have to walk to each other's houses and play board games and talk to their parents and talk to each other. And... Um, and yeah, by the, towards the end of the day, they're <laughs> itching to get, turn those things back on. And you better believe the minute the Sabbath ends, they're, they're all watching YouTube. But, um, <laughs> uh, but that does give a reset button um, to, to their tech use. I think one thing it's interesting to hear across the panel, and this is definitely dovetails with the research literature as well, is that there is this big range of both technical tools that we can use and social tools that we can use. So mm. technical is things like parental control tools and resources, yeah. Amazon, Apple, Google, you know, a lot of particular apps have them. And then social resources like, you know, we try not to have phones at the table, you know, things like, you know, you have to have your bedroom door open if you're using your tablet in your bedroom. And then there's things that we can do that are both restricting and enabling. So I like to, like the metaphor I use is probably more around a toolkit and of make, trying to make sure, you know, because the literature really shows that actually no one of those tools alone is necessarily going to be successful in terms of getting parents really to kind of both um, empathize with and understand what their kids are interested in, nor in the process or the, you know, the goal of trying to keep their kids safe online. So for me also, I try to, you know, if I've really been 
kind of on a limiting kick. You know, I've been like relying a lot on my tech tools and my restrictions. I try to think about, okay, is there like an opportunity to really share in some like joy and pleasure and kind of what, you know, sometimes called active mediation together. So can we play a game? Can we watch a show? My kids are super into this show, um, Gut Job, which is about like <laughs> DIY, you know, house renovation. <laughs> and it's a great example where like, I don't know that this is like great quality kids media, but it's great because it gives us a ton of opportunity a to like sit and like chill out together the interaction and also like you know we talk a lot about like oh you know this thing didn't go according to plan in this house renovation like they found black mold in the ceiling you know and and then really kind of unpack like actually okay this is actually how we deal with adversity or um you know this is like you know things change and like that can be a good thing for example for my son who never wants anything to move or change in the house at all <laughs> I knew we were going to run over, and I'm going to make sure we're not, but we have so much to talk about. I thought maybe we could play kind of a rapid-fire game to sum things up. Um, I don't know if I made this up, but I was thinking about it, and I said, you know, if we could just, like, we could, but should we is the game. Okay. And I have not prepped them on this, so this should be interesting. Um, so there are a lot of things we can do. We heard earlier that 87% of parents um, have used tech tools to monitor their kids' online usage, and also the researchers talked a lot about that, that tension between um, privacy and freedom, and kind of wanting to empower and give our kids freedom. So round one of we could, but should we? Check your child's total screen time every day. No, we could. How about some fun? We could, yes. but should we? No. Mm -mm. <laughs> um, so. Should we? I think we should. I just. Like, who has time for that? Yeah. <laughs> what about um, searches? Should you check who your kids, what your kid's searching online? Yes. 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 I would say yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, so I don't see a problem with any of this as long as it comes back to your why. Like, if your why is that, like, I don't know, the metaphors that we keep talking about, so the metaphor that keeps coming to mind is the one that um, Larry Maggot, our CEO at Connect Safely, coined years ago, we said the most important filter that parents can focus on is the gonna... filter we're building between our kids' ears. Yep. So if we're doing this because we're going to use that as a conversation starter to help them process and reflect, to build that filter, the one that we care about, then yes, do all of these things. Yeah, the younger, sure. my younger kids, I do have parental controls that show me what searches, um, but only on some of the devices. Like, it doesn't cover everything that, that they pick up. And the more important thing is to actually have conversations with your kids and know who they are, where they are, and what would freak them out if they saw. <laughs> if they yeah. searched for X and they got Y, would they be like, ooh, or would they be like, ah? Yeah. So. <laughs> um, what about, there are so many, all of a sudden there's so many ways that we can kind of keep track of our kids. It's not just the screen time and the tracking, but there's, Things like Find My on Apple, there's others on Google. Um, any rules around that? Should, we could, but should we? I do. I do, yeah. yeah. I do. We definitely send our kids with the watches on at school. There's just a lot going on. So I think it, it for a parent, as a parent, it makes me feel yeah, a lot Yeah, peace better. of mind. Yeah. This is an, I think this is one where age is really important to think about and also the physical layout of where you live. Do you live in a city yeah. mm -hmm. where your kids are taking public transportation or is it, play, you know, like are they on bikes, are they in cars? I, I do, like my fourth graders now walk to school independently, which hooray, like we've reached the promised land. But, um, <laughs> you know, so we did, you know, we did get them the watches yeah. so that, like, so it enables them to have more physical autonomy and safety because I'm able to see, did they get to school safely? So I think there is that balance, but it can be really enabling. My, my nine-year-old has lost his smartwatch eight times. <laughs> so in, yeah. for, in my family, it's reciprocal. I can track them and they can track me. That's what was my next so we're question, all, actually. we're all accountable to each other. We have this, that was our most recent debate in my family, is my husband finds this incredibly invasive and creepy. <laughs> and so he's, blocked it on his phone. <laughs> and he and I were traveling this weekend and our son was still in California and he hadn't responded to a couple texts and my son, my husband was getting frustrated with that. And I said, well, let me just check if he's where he's supposed to be. I checked, he's where he's supposed to be. It's actually an activity where he should be very active and not on his phone. I was like, yeah, he's fine. 
He's like, wait a second. And I was like, well, it's reciprocal. He, he, he can track me, I can track him. We have an agreement and it makes my life easier. And yeah. Sorry, microphone. Um, to the point, I think, Alicia, that you just made, is like, that's when my son got a phone. The watches weren't there yet, but like, that's when he got a phone, when it made my life easier and gave me peace of mind. But it definitely is a catalyst for conversation. But that, I think, but that transparency between you and your kid, I think, is so important in terms of like, if they're getting to an age where actually that does start to feel very privacy invasive, or you know, kind of you're surveilling them unduly, I think that yeah. is, you know, it's important to open that back up. That that tightrope, I think, if we could sum it up into one word for me, transparency would be it. But maybe I know we're down to our last minute. So do you have one last word you would want to share? I mean, I, 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 we don't track our kids. We know where they are because we drove them there. <laughs> um, Same. So <laughs> I was out of school, um, yeah. I never that? thought to um, the transparency. I, I like the idea, but you know, we have a family WhatsApp group, so we're constantly posting back and forth, mm -hmm. and that, I guess, is a way of, uh, of keeping tabs on each other without... Um, I don't have an issue. I don't consider my kids to have a personal right to privacy, except for the older ones, but who are basically adults and they're off on their own. Um, so I don't have an issue with it, but we don't do that. So thank you all very much. Thank I think you. if we've shown one everything, that the one thing that is true is that parenting is individual and personal and that you need to be, parents need to be active, involved, and kind of thoughtful about your choices. I would say make a plan, but don't, you know, it's okay to deviate from it to your point. Like you can, you can loosen up on the guardrails if needed and follow your child's lead is what I kind of gathered as well. Open and, and honest And mine was going to be growth. Growth? For sure. Growth. Because I think it's, it's not just as simply laid out as everyone would like for it to be. I just think it's kind of like a learning process that you mold and grow as you can, as your kids continue to grow and as you grow too because I'm definitely not finished as well, so. <laughs> I feel like I've worked in the tech industry a little too long, but my first thought was iteration. <laughs> um, only because I feel like each stage that my kids get to, each interest that they develop, each um, developmental kind of need that they have, like we have to revisit the conversation. So it really is something that just kind of happens and refines itself kind of over and over again. Thank you all. Thank you.